Welcome to Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Thursday, August 31st. I'm your host, Tom Moore. The Indiana game is in two days. The game against Michigan in 86 days. Let's talk a little bit about that Indiana game today. We're going to be doing that with our buddy, Buckeye Huddle's X's and O's guru, Ross Fulton. He has, I'm sure, a lot of different thoughts uh, going into game one of the season. But I think, Ross, we are contractually obligated to ask you first about the quarterback battle. Kyle McCord getting the start over Devin Brown. You know, how much does this change anything in terms of what you're expecting from Ohio State, what they might be doing in certain, in, you know, in terms of what they're going to do on Saturday? And, you know, what are you looking to see? This is not, you know, a forever he's the number one quarterback. So what are you looking to see to feel comfortable with either one of them being the right guy to be the permanent starter? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if it changes anything. I, and I, I have to be frank, I'll be the first to admit, I, I haven't seen enough of either of them to be able to say whether, you know, whether it changes something. I, I, I find it, I found it interesting that people have drawn such strong opinions uh, in this quarterback battle where without anyone having the benefit of watching them in practice on a daily basis, they certainly haven't played enough in a game. Um, I suppose you would probably say that with Devin Brown, they would maybe be more of a use of the quarterback read run game. Um, and, you know, one thing I am looking for is, I mean, Ryan Day's talked about playing Devin Brown. You know, is that going to, how is that going to work exactly? And is there a possibility that they use him in, uh, you know, short yardage or goal line packages to bring in more of a run threat? To the quarterback position or is it more just like hey we're going to give you a series as an extension of the ongoing quarterback competition yeah I, our sense from listening to him was it's probably more the latter than the former at least to start but that's obviously subject to change i my sense is that he's a little leery about pulling a guy in the middle of the drive and having the red zone quarterback or the you know the goal line package or whatever but uh, you know, I, I will uh, raise my hand in addition to you and say, yeah, we probably don't have enough information to make a firm conclusion on that. So that is that is an OK th- say to th- uh, thing to say out loud. Uh, we don't necessarily know, but we'll all find out together on Saturday. So with it being a new starter, with it being Kyle Accord and with it being Devin Brown playing however and whenever Devin Brown is playing, do, does that mean you're leaning more on the run game? You know, and then Tom Allen talked about feeling pretty good about his defensive line and the OSU offensive line. They've got their five now, but it's still not a sure thing. So, you know, if the line struggles, is it better to have a runner at quarterback? You know, how does how does the you know the the new starter at quarterback and you know the new offensive line change maybe how you're approaching play calling? And you know, is Devin Brown a better fit if they, the line is a little shaky? So, yeah, and I, and I didn't address your, your earlier question, too, about, you know, what am I looking for in terms of, like, you know, what would count as good performance? I think that, I, I will say in general, like, I always think first games are a little tricky. Um, you know, I can think of a lot of fairly ugly first Ohio State games over the years. Um, you know, especially college football, you don't get, you know, you don't have a scrimmage. So, and... You know, I, I think people have sort of been like, this is a, you know, you got a three week run up to Notre Dame. Playing Indiana, even as if they're a bad Big Ten opponent on the road, they're still a Big Ten caliber team on the road. It's a lot different than playing Youngstown State at home. So I'm not expecting things to just all go smoothly for either quarterback. And I don't think that Kyle McCord or Devin Brown should be judged if it doesn't. Um, you know, Minnesota a few years ago was better than Indiana probably is going to be, but you know, CJ Stroud obviously had some growing pains. And I would actually look to that in terms of what how you want to approach with the new quarterback as an example. Um, you know, I thought in that game they did Ryan Day did a nice job really getting Stroud some easy throws. That's you know, I tend to lean that way. Like I want to get Kyle McCord a completion right away. Even if I'm throwing a bubble screen, if I'm throwing a tailback swing pass a quick hitch, something just like get it, get it going. Um, if, you know, I would, wouldn't be surprised if they came out early and tried to play quickly with some tempo and some quick passing game on the first drive and then sort of turn back 
towards running the football. You know, especially with McCord, I mean, I you have to you do have to take into account that, you know, he's not a runner. So you you schematically have to build it so that your run game accounts for the backside, you know, things we talked about. So like, you know, I'm interested, are they gonna use some heavier personnel packages? Are they gonna be effective off of bootlegs and play action passing game as a way uh, to constrain the defense? And, you know, I think your question about does a mo you know I don't want to assume that the offensive line is going to have issues. Um, I, I, with the mobile, it depends because, like, you know, Justin Fields is as mobile as they come, but he actually made – he can make his offensive line look bad because he'll hold the ball and hold the ball counting on his athleticism, which leads to sacks. So, you know, Tom Brady makes offensive lines look great because he got the ball out quickly. So it doesn't necessarily just how well you run. It's, how, how, it's also how quickly you're processing and, like, you know – I think there's you can make the argument a mobile quarterback can help. Conversely, you could say, well, our offensive line is not great. We have great skill position players. We want someone who's going to get the ball out quickly and get it to where it needs to go. Uh, you know, so that we're not making the offensive line hold out longer than it needs to. I, I want to circle back really quickly on something you said, sort of in the middle of that answer, and have you expand on it a little bit. Are there? basically two different, I mean, not two different playbooks, but maybe two different variations of the game plan, depending on whether you have Devin Brown in there versus Kyle McCord. Is that, you know, or, or you have kind of different plays that you sort of think you want to run with one versus the other? Yeah. And again, I have to caveat this again. I have, I've never watched Devin Brown play, right? So like, I can't say like on a spectrum, you know, I don't think he's Braxton Miller, you know, is he JT Barrett? I don't, I don't know, like, in terms of his mobility, is he, you know, so like, but yes, is the, is the general answer. So not necessarily like playbooks, but there are plays that you are more likely to emphasize. Obviously, the biggest being that like, in your run game, if your quarterback is, is a run threat, you can, you know, use plays. We've talked like, you know, zone read, we've talked about bash read, like they used to with Justin Fields run bash, and they didn't really run that play with C.J. Stroud because they didn't really want him having the possibility of having to keep the ball inside. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think this creates, though, you know, sort of assuming that Kyle McCord is more of a pro, quote-unquote pro-style quarterback pocket passer, right? You tend to then have to do other things, as I said, to, like, constrain the defense. But, so, like, you know, but Ohio State has really good wide receivers. So you don't want to, like, I you know, Ohio State's third wide receiver is better than their second tight end. Um, and so, you know, but I am looking for, like, how much multiple tight ends they use. You know, I think, do, you know, I someone tagged me in a clip this week on Twitter or whatever Twitter is now called. And, uh, you know, it was a play where Chip Trainum was lead blocking for Dallin Hayden. And so I've been kind of beating the drums for Trainum to have sort of, like, both, I mean, I think he'll play as a tailback as well, but I, I, to have like a sort of a fullback esque role, I think he'd be really effective, particularly on the backfield. Like, do we see Chip train up in that role as well? And so, like, just in terms of personnel packages, and you know, what have they done in the run game? Hopefully, you know, I think with Justin Fry, have they learned some lessons from the last couple of years a little bit, and you know, use a more diversified run game without the quarterback threat? to constrain the defense and what it's doing. One storyline that we haven't done a ton on this week, but I did want to ask you about is Matt Guerreri. He is the Indiana defensive coordinator. He has been on Jim Knowles' defensive staffs at a bunch of different spots. He was there at Duke. I think he was there at uh, Oklahoma state and, and then he was there at Ohio state. Now he was, so he was at Ohio state last year. Now he's the Indiana defensive coordinator. He was asked during his press conference this week in Bloomington by a reporter, you know, does, having lived with the Ryan Day offense in-house for a year give you, you know, a essentially a decided schematic advantage that you kind of, you know what this guy is going to do, more or less. So I'm going to play that clip for the folks that haven't ha- heard it, and then I want you to let me know, do you think what he's saying is accurate, and does it also potentially impact his knowledge of Jim Knowles' defense? 
This is an elite offense, right? Ryan Day has had some of the best offenses in college football his entire time at Ohio State. So um, while there is some familiarity from, you know, what the people look like and, and how they function from that standpoint, you still got to go stop them, right? And that's the biggest thing is, okay, what are the fundamentals of defense regardless of who we're playing against in opening games, how we tackle, how we vice the ball in space. Those are really the biggest things as far as execution on our part compared to saying, hey, I know exactly what's going to happen, right? They're going to have things that he's never shown before, different than when I was there, things like that. Um, so it, it's about us. I think the biggest impact is going to be, I, I do think it, it will help him. Um, I think in particular, like him knowing tendencies um, and like sort of what, um, you know, I mean, he's not, it's not like he sat in offensive coaching meetings last year right but he, he's around the building like he knows sort of tend like what I say likes to, and Ryan Day likes to do in certain down and distance situations um, and you know he's obviously going to know the personnel well I mean you know then again I mean I think any coach would opposing coach is going to know that Marvin Harrison Jr. is really good so I'm not sure like how much you know how much extra that adds but I do think he will be able to provide some guidance uh, to Indiana's offensive coaching staff regarding Knowles and what tendencies he has, and as well as having some insight into, you know, it's third and two from the Indiana 40. What might Ryan Day do? Now, you might guess wrong, but I think he'll have a little bit of a, a leg up compared to someone who's never been in the building with, with Day. All right, let's talk a little bit about that Jim Knowles defense. Obviously, that is one of the big stories of the year. Will they be better this year? Will they stop giving up so many big plays? Uh, on the defensive side of the ball, what are you most interested to see on Saturday, either personnel-wise or scheme-wise? What are you going to be looking for on Saturday out of the defense? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination because he's starting Sonny Siles at nickel, which means that you're essentially having a very different nickel setup than you used last year and we've talked about this a little bit but you're not you know you're not playing a 5 10 190 pound guy there um you're playing a you know 230 pound guy there so it's much closer to having a sam linebacker hybrid type so you know how does that impact their use of cover one man coverage are they playing more zone are they counting on styles are they flipping things around based on the tight end and then you know off of that, I mean, again, Knowles mentioned this week that, you know, bumping Jordan Hancock to nickel in passing situations. So, like, how often are they playing with a third quarter there instead? And, like, in those situations, what are they doing? You know, the styles coming off the field. Like, notably, when Knowles talked about it, and, like, I think a follow-up question was, like, well, what do you do with styles in those situations? Like, he didn't say, like, put him back at deep safety. He's like, I'll, if he could play as a linebacker or, like, other things closer to the box. So, you know, those things. And then personnel wise, like I, you know, I, I think obviously there's been a lot of focus on the quarterback. I think it was, it's a little disquieting that they still have at least according to Knowles, a three-way battle at the, you know, quote unquote adjuster or field safety position. Like that's the quarterback of the defense, if you will. And, um, you know, they've really kind of struggled at that. Ohio state has struggled at that position since, at least Jordan Fuller in 2019. And so they really need to shore up their play there. And like, that's kind of bit them and not having like a rangy safety since that time. And so, um, you know, I, I still think it'll be uh, Jihad Carter probably starting there, but um, you know, that's just me guessing. Um, and so I, I, I'm interested, you know, he talked about all three of those guys playing. So it's like, again, like, does that actually happen? What does that look like? Um, and like, how much does it look like an ongoing competition versus, you know, Hey, we're going to play one guy and then maybe we're, you know, Malik Harford as a freshman, we want to give him snaps too. Uh, one of the things that's a question entering Saturday is who's going to be the Indiana starting quarterback. The Buckeyes announced their starter earlier this week. The Buckeyes also bravely announced their starting place kicker earlier this week. Indiana head coach, Tom Allen decided, no, no, we're going to make it a big surprise on Saturday. Would announce his starting kicker, didn't announce his starting quarterback either. It's going to be either Brendan Soresby or Taven Jackson. Jackson is a Tennessee transfer and sort of broadly considered the favorite to win the job. But both guys are redshirt freshmen. Neither guy has started yet. When you are preparing for an opposing offense and you don't know who the quarterback is, and you know one's probably a little more athletic than another, how big of a deal is that 
in terms of your game prep or when it's Ohio State and Indiana, is it kind of you're going to run your stuff and just sort of adjust once you figure it out? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I think this like college football coach paranoia gamesmanship stuff that's, you know, like we're not going to announce starters. We're not going to release a depth chart is all like it doesn't make that much of a difference. Like, I think especially in this situation, given the amount of transfers Indiana has and everything else, not I mean, not just a quarterback, but across the board, I think that Knowles will probably lean towards like I'm going to run my defense and like I'll adjust as needed. But, like, I'm not going to come up with, for instance, like, two separate game plans. Like, I think he wants to get his team rolling the way he wants to, like, s- schematically. And then, as I said, it, you can adjust from there. But I, I do think, like, you know, I guess the one exception to that would be if, again, I, I you know, I, maybe we'll see it more with, like, a Western Kentucky. But essentially, Ohio State's playing much more of a... Uh, a heavier package, if you will, with styles than they did last year. And so it's like, again, if Indiana comes out with like four and five wide all the time, I don't think they're going to, but just in theory, if they did, uh, in actuality, they used a lot of two tight ends last year. So it fits well with styles, but like how, do, how is Ohio State going to adjust when they're seeing like a very light packages? Um, but again, I, I think that like for this game, particularly game one, like as Noel said, like there could be so many things thrown at them. I think they just have to roll with what they do and then, you know, adjust as, as they need to. So the Buckeyes are favored by 30 points, give or take on Saturday. So this is probably not going to be, this is not one of those talent is equated games for sure that Ryan Day will talk about from time to time. Is there anything you could see on Saturday against Indiana knowing that, okay, this is not a talent is equated game. Is there anything you could see on Saturday that would make you say, yes, haha, they have they have definitely improved some things on the defense, they have solved some issues on the defense, or is this a game, and if so, what? Or is this a game where the only things you could see are bad? They could shut out Indiana and it doesn't really matter until they play a tougher opponent, or you know, the only things that you could see that would make you change your opinion on anything would be, hey, uh-oh, Indiana scored 30 points. Now, as you know, you know, I'm, I'm partial to the Bill Conleys of the world who, you know, everything you can judge relative to the quality of the opponent you're playing. Um, I, I don't buy into that last year, like Ohio State's defense was fine and it was something suddenly about, um, you know, those last couple of opponents, they were just better and they like exposed something that hadn't been there before. Like the issues were there before and it just was a team then exploited it more, um, that, you know, had better talent. So, you know, they were there against Penn State. I mean, I think Ohio State was good on defense, not great, and their weaknesses caught up with them. Um, so, yes, to your question, if Ohio State is playing dominantly on defense, I think that bodes well. I mean, I think that there will be ways to tell that, like, hey, this is an improve, a further improved defense. And, like, you know, they should be. I mean, they have a ton of guys back who have a lot of experience at this point. So, I think you'd be pretty disappointing if, if there was struggles, but I also think that you can take heart if, um, you know, they're playing in a, in a pretty convincing fashion. And that applies on offense, too. I mean, the same principles apply. Like, you, you, there definitely will be takeaways, even if you're playing a lesser opponent. All right. And finally, speaking of extrapolating off of small data sets, uh, the clock rules... Week one, there were, it was like, what, seven to ten fewer snaps per game, give or take. The game length was about the same, which means hooray, more commercials, but the same, you know, but less football. So great. Uh, if you are game planning, does that make any difference at all in your mind, or is this one of those things? Ryan Day will always say, like, well, it's the same for both teams, so you know, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Does if, if the game is shortened in terms of the number of plays now with these new clock rules, does that change anything about how you're approaching things on offense or defense in terms of game planning? Yeah, I, I'm kind of, I mean, I think Brian Day say it's a little too soon to t- tell, and I kind of agree. I'm, I'm, I'm probably, you know, probably wrong on this, but to me, when I heard that stat, I was like, well, was there four or five games last week? And one of them was Navy. And so Navy, like, has always run, when you're playing a triple option team, you're always going to have a super low number of plays relative to essentially the rest of college football. So I do wonder how much that's, like, skewing that number. So I do think we'll have to see how that plays out this week, but I don't know if it so much changes 
the overall like scheme or strategy um maybe it does once you get a lead i don't know but like i think that it may change how deep they want to go rotation wise so again i i you know they have a lot of running backs that they want to play um you know they have five at least five guys probably a wide receiver that they want to play i mean i can't imagine harrison and emeka buka come off the field too much but again it makes you you know if you have a few less plays conversely do you need to play three or four tailbacks. Um, and so it'll, it will be interesting to see how they handle that. Uh, but I think, you know, have to see how it plays out a little bit before adjust too much. I mean, the NFL has played with those rules for years. And, you know, yes, they have fewer plays, but they'd still play, you know, multiple tailbacks and, and try to keep guys fresh. So I think, you know, I think uh, scheme-wise, I think Ohio State will probably just try to start strong the way they would either way and, and sort of feel it out from there. All right. Well, if you enjoy listening to Ross talk about football, just like I do, uh, a great place to do that was at BuckeyeHuddle.com. He is on our message board there, answering lots of questions, responding to people's uh, thoughts on different uh, the quarterback battle, how many wide receivers are going to play this year, all sorts of defensive questions, and much, much more. He is just one of our X's and O's gurus there at BuckeyeHuddle.com, making you a smarter football fan. So make sure you find him on our board there. Sign up today to become a member and get access to his his wisdom, as well as the rest of our scheme guru, gurus, as rest as, as well as our recruiting guys, Alex and Mark, uh, covering recruiting for us. Tony, Kevin, and I covering the team. Really fun and active community all there at BuckeyeHuddle.com. So if you've been thinking about signing up, boy, would this be a great time to do it? Give you a full month of coverage, uh, including that Notre Dame game uh, in that first month, and then see if you like it. And if you do, stick around for uh, – you can sign up for a year, get yourself a discount. And uh, you'll have uh, plenty to have Ross on every week. After those games, to sort of break some things down, we've uh, been talking about some cool and different things we might be able to do to make those a little uh, a little more visually interesting for you, and be able to hopefully uh, show what we're show what we're talking about a little bit better. We'll see if we can pull that off next week for you. But uh, that you can you can look forward to that on the uh, Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning feed uh, and your uh, on YouTube at youtubecom slash Huddle. We'll also be doing our post game instant reaction show uh, live as soon as that game ends on Saturday. So. Make sure you're subscribed to our channel at youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. Hit that bell so you get notified as soon as we go live so you don't miss anything. Those shows are always very popular. So uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy that. And then finally, make sure you are checking out all of our podcasts. They're on all of your fine podcast platforms of choice. Search, just search Buckeye Huddle to find all of them. And if you could do us a solid and leave us a five-star rating and review, that helps other folks find those shows. It doesn't take long on your end, and we truly appreciate it. That will do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>